Well, hello and uh, welcome to this, the ninth in our series of P2 webinars. And uh, this week we're looking at a subject that I personally find uh, absolutely fascinating. And that's the subject of philosophy and how some of the thoughts of the great philosophers might shine a new light on what matters when we project manage. As a philosopher we'll meet a bit later, uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein says, philosophy is not a body of doctrine, but an activity. Its aim is the logical clarification of thought. And as such, I think it's uh, really helpful to think about project management or any area philosophically to force us to logically clarify our thoughts about that topic and therefore get to know it fresh and understand it a bit deeper. But before we dive headlong into philosophy, let me uh, remind everyone that this session is going to be about half an hour. Um, we won't have time for questions, unfortunately, but please do uh, write in and ask them as we always do come back after the session uh, with answers. And of course, you'll receive a recorded copy of this session after the event. So please do feel free to share those. For those who don't know me, my name's Adam Skinner. Uh, I'm Director of Consulting here at P2 Consulting. P2 is, of course, the award-winning digital transformation consultancy set up seven years ago to offer a real alternative to the big four. We delight our clients, uh, some of the biggest names in retail, finance, and many other sectors, by always delivering on our three P2 promises to improve, control, and deliver on their transformation promises. And we would, of course, be delighted to talk to anyone in more detail about our 12 core services. However, we've got 3,000 years of philosophy to try and pack into 27 minutes. So normally uh, I'd start a talk on philosophy with uh, Socrates, Plato and Aristotle, but uh, I'm actually going to start with, with this chap here, this chap Heraclitus. Heraclitus lived between 535 and 475 BC in ancient Greece and was obsessed with change. He believed that everything was in a constant state of flux. It was he who coined the phrase, no man steps into the same river twice. Neither the river nor you are the same, as well as the phrase, everything flows. That's why I like to think of him as the patron philosopher of project managers, because both he and we are obsessed with change and what change does to the world. He also believed fire was the fundamental element from which everything else sprang. And given so many projects are launched from a burning platform, it just seemed incredibly apt. So Heraclitus, the patron philosopher of project managers. Of course, having said that, the rest of his philosophy was pretty barking mad. So let's jump 7,000 kilometers east now to China, where at roughly the same time, Confucius, the father of Eastern philosophy, was compiling his great work, The Analects. Confucius's impact on Eastern philosophy, thinking and culture can't be overstated. Uh, although there were a range of different philosophers working in ancient Greece who built up the thinking and ideas of Western philosophy over time, Confucius was very much like the Beatles uh, to Eastern philosophy. He pretty much single-handedly laid the foundations for all Eastern philosophy from that point on. And whereas Western philosophy tended to be focused inward and on individuals with questions like how do I know things, how do I live a good life, and so on, Eastern philosophy is far more focused on society and people in that society, how they should function, the relationships between those individuals. So for someone who's interested in organizations and how one builds organizations, actually Eastern philosophy has a load of really interesting stuff in it. The difference between Eastern and Western philosophy is actually really fascinating. That that's individualistic side of Western philosophy against the societal focus of Eastern philosophy. And you can actually see how it impacts the cultures, the language, and even the way people in those different cultures perceive each other. It's absolutely fascinating, But but that's an entire webinar on its own. So let's jump back to Confucius. So when Confucius was asked what he would do if given a position of power, he instantly answered it would be to assure that names were applied correctly. For if names are not correct, then speech will not be in accordance with actuality. And when speech is not in accordance with actuality, things will not be successfully accomplished. He's making two really critical points here. One is about language uh, and the other is about governance. If you substitute the word role for name, you'll see what I mean. Confucius was making the point that if you aren't clear and precise about the roles that people are in and the capability those people need to fill those roles, then the things they say and do won't be the right things. But he goes further to say that when things aren't successfully accomplished, then ritual practices and music will fail to flourish. Now, now what, what he's getting at there is that actually society functions and drives on the standards of practices of ritual and governance. And he's actually obsessed about kind of ritual and governance. So when the, wrong, when the roles are wrong, when people are doing the wrong things in those roles, then the rituals of society don't occur and chaos 
reigns. Now, anyone who's a project manager or has a PMO background knows what Confucius is getting at. He's telling us to focus on the roles and responsibilities and the governance structures and rituals that tie together a program. Because without that structure, the program's ways of working won't align to reality around it, and it both can't and won't be able to deliver. So names and roles and the capability to deliver those roles were critical to Confucius, but not in isolation. For him, the critical point was how individuals related to each other. Indeed, more than just critical for him, whether you live the virtuous life or not was entirely dependent on whether your relationships aligned to his understanding of virtue, which you'll see in this table. So actually, whether you're a good person or not depends on whether your relationship to other people aligns to these 10 righteousness points. So, for instance, a subject needs to be loyal to the ruler, but the ruler in turn needs to be benevolent to the subject. And for him, that was what a virtue looked like. A really important point there. Um, uh, and it really does help us look at what we do in projects and programs. It's, it's really hard not to draw parallels with the world of change management here, with the critical point being that although a clear role on the program is important, more important is to understand how the different roles relate and interact with each other. So Confucius was incredibly keen on clear roles, clear language, structured relationships and formal rights. And his views dominated Asian philosophy for, for, for many, many years. However, there was an opposing viewpoint. There was a philosopher called Mo Tzu, and he lived about 100 years after Confucius. So, you know, he was a really charismatic leader, and he led an army of idealistic warrior philosophers to roam the Chinese countryside, coming to the aid of small states being threatened by their larger bullying neighbours. And quite frankly, if that isn't the plot of a smash hit Netflix series, I don't know what is. But, but Mo Tzu rejected the concept that virtuous, being virtuous depended entirely on aligning to strict rules of relationships and that you should always defer to tradition for tradition's sake. Mo Tzu believed virtue came from doing the most good wherever you could and that this required you to think outside the box and occasionally change how you operated and what the traditions might say. Mo Tzu uh, liked to look at virtue through three lenses. One of precedent. What do the methodologies, what do, what do the rights say? So that's kind of the Confucius point of view. But also he'd flow in their evidence. What have I seen of or heard that works in this situation? So a pragmatic view. And third was application. What does common sense tell me is the right thing to do? In short, Motsu was very agile in his thinking. He decided it was important for you to be able to decide for yourself what is right not always have to go on what the Confucius relationship says. I love this because in some ways it highlights the gap between a classic waterfall PMO and an agile PMO. Uh, the Confucius PMO manager is very disciplined around roles, responsibilities, governance and reporting. The Mozu PMO manager is more focused on where they can deliver the most value, despite what the rules and the regulations might say. I actually find that a really helpful model to ask yourself before going into an engagement. What's right for this engagement? Am I more on the Confucius side around governance, roles and rights, or am I more around the mode suicide around focusing on what is the right thing to do at that particular time? Principles, practice, experience, common sense, all really useful things to apply to any situation. But let's leave the ancient world and PMO philosophy behind and jump forward 2000 years to Europe, because the next bit of philosophy I'd like to explore is called epistemology. The study of nature of knowledge, or to put it in another way, how do we know things? How do we know what's right in front of us? I can't overstate how big a topic this is for Western philosophy, particularly with centuries of philosophers falling roughly into two camps. One were the rationalists who believed pretty much everything can be thought out from first principles. And of course, the patron saint of those rationalists was Descartes, his cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am being the prime example of that mindset. In the other camp, the empiricists who believe that truth only exists in what I can see and what I can experience. Again, as a project manager, I find this a really useful area to think about. So much of our job is about trying to understand how much truth I can put into each bit of information or each bit of conversation I have. had. How much do I believe what I'm hearing? Uh, this is particularly true with a digital transformation where, because we're dealing with code, the only true value is when a user successfully engages with the system with that working code. So a huge part of our job is trying to work out if we believe a rag or if we believe a program plan or if we believe a metric uh, and whether that tells us that we're on track or otherwise. So the, the, the nature of information, whether we can believe it or not, is, is just incredibly important to what we do. 
And that's one of the things this philosopher Leibniz focused on. Leibniz lived between 1646 and 1716 AD and was a genuine polymath, as well as being a top rank philosopher. He was a superb mathematician. He invented calculus at roughly the same time as Descartes. He was an excellent engineer and spent most of his life as a diplomat, a librarian, and even a family historian. But he was also obsessed with something called apperception. Now, apperception literally means how do you learn something from past experience? How do I process information and take it inside myself? And here I'm indebted to Ian Hollywood, who reminded me about this useful link. In other words, if I was to look at a red car, what's happening inside me to make me experience red car? Now, Leibniz, he hypothesized that things that can be experienced are broken down into component experiences known as monads. And it's those monads that are recompiled inside ourselves to create memory and experience. For instance, in experiencing a red car, I might be experiencing a monad of redness or a monad of car and a monad of speed. And those concepts create inside me a holistic experience of red car. Uh, I actually find this a, a really useful mental model when building any project reporting framework or, or artifacts. It forces me to ask the question, what is the smallest unit of information I'm using to build this report? Is it a milestone? Is it the project level risk? Are they all at roughly the same level of extraction? It's a powerful exercise to think about what those monads of information you're using are and how you can balance them in detail in your reporting. So if Leibniz reminds us to worry about the level of detail in our reporting, this next philosopher challenges the very basis of all reporting. Immanuel Kant, as, as well as being a real peasant who was very rarely sober, was a preeminent philosophical genius of the Enlightenment. I also guarantee your worldview has been shaped by him. Uh, Kant developed the logical underpinnings for what we call the, his categorical imperatives. And there are the three rules that he came up with. Um, there's a, a lot of words in there, but basically, if you take them together, they give a fairly unshakable logical basis for why we should try, treat others as we want to be treated by ourselves. Uh, this had huge cultural and political impact in Europe and more or less underpinned the Western liberal society and moral mindset for the next 300 years. Back to project management. Uh, when Kant came on the scene in 1781 with his critique of pure reason, the philosophical world was split between the rationalists, I think, therefore I am, and the empiricists, I only believe what I can see, hear and experience. Kant drove a horse and cart through both of the, their worlds with one simple but brilliant realisation. He pointed out in his critique that between what I experience and what is out there in reality is a theatre. So between myself and between the rate car, there's a really important filter. And that filter are the senses and the apparatus of our brain. He pointed out that we have no way to directly access reality except through these filters. And therefore, we can never genuinely know what exists out there because the filters of our senses bound the experience. Think about how the sun pumps out light at all different wavelengths of the spectrum. Yet we as humans can only access the bits of the light spectrum that our eyes can interpret. We can never directly access x-rays, for instance. Now, if you scale that concept up to the entirety of reality, you realise we are like a person trying to experience the majesty of the Grand Canyon whilst looking through a pinhole camera. So it really didn't matter if you're an empiricist or a rationalist. Either way, you can never experience true reality as it's filtered through your senses and your brain. Now, had, Kant had a word for this real reality, uh, a great German word, Ding and Schick, the thing in itself. And essentially what he's pointing out here is, although I'm experiencing a red car, I'm seeing that red car filtered through my sense in my brain. So I have no way of knowing what that red car is in reality, what that red car is in its self. Again, I find this a hugely powerful mental model for a project manager. manager. The reality and progress towards the code or the change we are creating has to be necessarily filtered through our senses, but also through dashboards and plans and burn down charts and defect tracking metrics. All these tools and artifacts are there to help us access the reality of the change we're trying to implement, but they are not that reality. They are not that change. And we get in real danger if we start to mistake the tool, the dashboard, for the reality of the change. Now, Kant was brilliant. Uh, you'd need to jump forward over 150 years to Vienna to come across a philosopher as radical. This rather haunting young man is Ludwig Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein, along with his mentor, the famous British pacifist and atheist Bertrand Russell, was the dominant philosopher of the first half of the last century. He only wrote two books in his life, one at the beginning 
and one published posthumously. And they both rather unhelpfully took slightly different positions around linguistic philosophy or what words mean. His earlier work, the Tracticus Logico Philosophicus, published in 1922, focuses again on knowledge and how we share it. But whereas Kant talked about the senses and the brain being the filter that bounded how we receive knowledge, Wittgenstein took a more interesting perspective on it. Wittgenstein spoke of the language and images with which we codify, which we capture knowledge, and he talked of them as a translation device that allows us to transfer information. And so the language itself acts as a filter and a tool that transfers, but also traps and bounds that knowledge. Let me give you a worked example. Um, I'm looking out of the window and I see a fancy red sports car. And I want to get across to someone else just how fancy red and sporty it is. But all I have are a series of Duplo bricks. So I can only get a vague sense of what that red sporty sports car looks like. If I use finer Lego blocks, I can get more of how it looks to you across. And if I can use technical Lego, I can get loads of how it looks across and also some of how it works across to you as well. So the closer the building blocks are to the reality, the more of the knowledge of that reality I can get across. But, and this is the really critical point, I can never get across to you the actual reality as I'm working with Lego. Now, if you replace Lego with language, you see the fascinating point that Wittgenstein is trying to make. Language is a device to capture reality. And the more refined the language, the closest you're going, closer you're going to get to be able to transfer it across the reality. But it will never be that reality, just as the technical never let Lego will never be the red sports car. Being a philosopher, Wittgenstein believed our ability to perceive reality was fundamentally bounded by our ability to use language to express reality. Because, of course, we think with words and images. So because those words and images aren't the actual reality, because those words and images are bounded, our actual thinking and our ability to engage with the world is bounded by that thing. He finished his first book with a poetic and haunting phrase, what can be said at all can be said clearly, and what we cannot talk about we must pass over in silence. These were the last words he voluntarily published in his lifetime. He had used words to express all he could, the rest was beyond the weak tool of language to express, and so would remain forever unsaid. Uh, th this always blows my mind, uh, particularly when in my PMO manager role, writing and receiving status updates and dashboard. For me, the really useful analogy here is the Lego analogy. When I'm building my report or my plan, I need to ask myself, how fine is the tool I'm using to capture the reality of the change program? For a plan, should I be expressing that reality of milestones on a daily or a weekly basis? The, the finer the data points, the closer it will be to the possible reality I'm trying to get across. But of course, it will never be a perfect reflection. It can't be. Wittgenstein says so. So if none of these tools or artifacts can ever show us the truth, then what on earth is the point of creating them? Well, this next philosopher might provide us with a few clues. Martin Heidegger was born in Vielha also and lived from 1889 to 1976. Unlike Wittgenstein, though, Heidegger happened to be a Nazi, which is really a good thing and probably why his philosophy didn't do particularly well after the war. But there are some really interesting insights in his 1927 masterwork, Being in Time. Whereas most philosophers up until this point talked about individuals and objects being separate things, with the challenge being, being how the individuals know the reality of the object, Heidegger took a different view. He felt that when you observed and interacted with something in reality, you didn't simply know that thing, you created a new object that is an amalgam of you and the object that has a force and a purpose or a being all its own. By observing the red car, I'm not simply trying to create an image of the car in my mind. I'm actually creating for a split second a new being with a specific force that impacts the world. In this case, the force would be probably to buy a red sports car. Now, this is pretty trippy stuff, but, but it actually has some really interesting relevance in the project management sphere, uh, so much so that I based a lot of my masters on it. Uh, imagine a program plan and two different program directors. Program director one is committed to planning milestones and regular reporting. It's a very structured approach to delivering his change program. Whereas program director two is far more interested in the stakeholder engagement and the upwards management of his program. 
The force created by director one and the plan will be fundamentally different to the force created by director two and the plan. The director one plan force will also almost certainly involve a huge amount of emphasis during program boards on the milestones in the plan and movement around those milestones. The director two plan force will almost certainly focus on engaging stakeholders and senior management to take them with you on the journey. Whenever I build governance and artifacts for a programme, I find it really helpful to think about not just the artifact, but the key role that artifact will support and the force pairings created by those two individuals. How will that, sorry, that not two individuals, by that individual and that artifact, how will that particular product owner and that particular product roadmap work together? How will that particular benefit case and that particular CEO work together? It's powerful stuff and it really will impact how you design your artifacts. But we still don't know what truth is. And I've been talking at you for about 20 minutes about uh, old men. So let's move across and have a look at this rather special lady. This lady is called Mary Midgley, and she's a modern philosopher who was a re really was really awesome, really interesting, and sadly passed away a few years ago. She wrote a great deal about science, ethics, and human rights, and had absolutely no time for reductionist and overly scientific thinking, and particularly when they came at the expense of an idea's humanity. She also came up with my all-time favourite quote about philosophy. Philosophy is like plumbing. Nobody notices until something goes wrong, and then you have to pull up the floorboards to find what smells. In her 2004 classic, The Myths We Live By, she essentially rejects the idea that there is a single truth out there and compares trying to understand reality to trying to understand a new land by looking at lots of different maps. Some maps will show different parts of the surface. Other maps, are, uh, other maps will show the geological structure. Others will show the heights and the depths. None of these maps are lies. They're just different snapshots of the whole. And by taking them all together, you're able to build up a much more detailed and rich understanding of what lies out there. She also compared it to staring into a fishbowl. You can look at the whole of the fishbowl from above. So you, you can't, sorry, you can't look at the whole of the fishbowl from above. So you peer in at different angles through the glass and try slowly to piece it together uh, through the different angles, through the different distorted views. And eventually you get an understanding of what sits inside that fishbowl. Again, I find this many maps, many windows model incredibly useful when trying to understand what's going on in a program. No single metric image or conversation will give me the full picture. Instead, I need to make time so I can engage with the program through as many lenses as possible in order to build up as complete a picture of the program, always accepting that the map is not the territory. There is always going to be a gap in our understanding. So what have we learned so far from this dive into philosophy? We've learned about the importance of rights and roles, but not at the expense of doing good. We've explored the nature of reality and how we struggle to access it, how it gets distorted by our senses and our language. We've explored the importance of thinking about how we share and engage with information, the size of that information, the language used and the way it's expressed. And we've looked at how different people will engage with different artifacts in different ways. We've talked about using many maps and many windows as a way of overcoming the basic failures in our abilities to access reality. Well, look, I hope you found that interesting and informative, and it's given you some stuff to think about as you do your project management. Uh, as mentioned, we'll be looking to answer all the questions after the event, and we'll be sending this webinar out as a, 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 an email, so do feel free to share it. Um, we'll be back in a fortnight's time with a more traditional webinar looking at continuous testing and how you create release on demand, which is, of course, a really important part of any movement to continuous improvement and continuous delivery. And then two weeks later, I'll be talking again about the future of project management and looking at some of the major trends we're seeing in the market that are driving where project management is, is going and what skills you might need to stay on the cutting edge. If you want to discuss this or any other webinar on the show, please do drop me an email, either at P2 or over LinkedIn. But I couldn't possibly close this webinar without spending a few minutes with uh, these three chaps, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. And I'm actually going to focus on Socrates, who uh, is an amazing character. Socrates uh, is often considered not just the father of Western philosophy, but in a very real sense, the father of Western thinking. And of everyone we've talked about today, I think Socrates provides the most important lesson for us as project managers, because there are three really important lessons we can draw from Socrates and uh, his life. 
Socrates would walk every day through the Agora and people would stand on the side of the road and hope he'd pick them out because actually each day he'd pick out one of those bystanders and he'd debate with them important questions. Why are we here? What is beauty? Is there such a thing as right? This question and answer method of learning is now known as the Socratic method and it forms the basis of most modern education where one expects to go on an intellectual journey by asking questions about the topic one's exploring. So the first really important thing I want to remember Apologies, I think you lost me there for a second. Um, the first really important thing I want to remember about Socrates is that he was incredibly intellectually curious. I had a real insatiable intellectual curiosity, um, a really important point. The second really important point to make is he was intellectually humble. It's said that when the Oracle of Delphi announced that he was the wisest man in all Athens, his response was that if he was wiser than others, simply because he knows nothing. He was hugely aware of how much there was out there still to learn and humble in the face of that lack of knowledge. And finally, he was fearless with the truth and true to himself. He consistently irritated the leaders of Athens by challenging their aggression and the notion that might be wrong. He irritated them so much that they had him arrested for corrupting the minds of the youths of Athens and for impiety. And he was sentenced to death, death by drinking hemlock, which was the custom in those days. But rather than fleeing the city and living in exile, which is actually what everyone expected him to do, he calmly accepted his fate and drank the poison surrounded by his friends and family. And this very famous painting on the right here shows that with him taking the poison, but also pointing upwards as he discusses the world and reality and the heavens. His final act was to dictate his experience of dying to his scribe, so even his death could be useful in expanding knowledge. It's a true commitment to intellect, to, uh, to knowledge, absolutely fearless with the truth. As project managers, we almost by definition live in a constant state of uncertainty and the unknown. Our job is quite literally to carve out a new organisation from the uncertainty of the future and to try and drag people kicking and screaming into that new world. Socrates' gift to us are the tools to deal with that uncertainty. We must be insatiably intellectually curious and be comfortable taking people with us with that intellectual curiosity. We must be humble in the face of that uncertainty and everything we don't know. And finally, of course, we must be true to ourselves and what we do know and hold on to that certainty through the hard and challenging times that come with every major transformation. And if we can do those three things, then we can truly claim to be philosopher project managers. Thank you. Have a lovely weekend.